Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jeff Freeman. The Consumer Brands Association is the champion for the entire consumer packaged goods industry, which represents 20 million jobs in the United States. We focus on enterprise-wide issues for companies, such as packaging sustainability, smart regulation, and frictionless supply chains, all while positioning our members as champions of the consumer. We aim to create a better future for CPG by bringing the industry together around common goals that create a stronger and more unified collective. When we launched the CPG Speak series earlier this summer, it was with the intent of providing brands an opportunity to learn from each other, how they've navigated the first half of 2020 and how they're thinking about the future. We've had a lot of great conversations so far, and I'm confident that today's discussion will be one of our best. As always, we'd like to thank PwC for their support of the CPG Speak series and especially their partnership in making today's session possible. Today, we're joined by Jessica Alba, founder, and Nick Vallejo, CEO of The Honest Company, for a discussion moderated by Paul Linewan, principal with PwC Strategy Consulting Business. Paul is an expert on growth, having, is an expert on growth, having conducted research into how companies have been successful and publishing many books and articles on the topic with Harvard Business Review. Jessica founded The Honest Company in 2011, recognizing that if she was searching for a trusted brand, others were as well. Her focus on the consumer is what has driven the success of The Honest Company to this day. Nick came to The Honest Company in 2017 after a long tenure with the Clorox Company, serving most recently as a global chief operating officer. Their focus on the consumer and building trust are two of the Consumer Brands Association's priorities which makes this a timely conversation. Today, Jessica, Nick, and Paul will discuss how The Honest Company has leveraged a startup mentality to authentically understand and connect with consumers and how they've stayed on top of innovation. With that, Paul, let me turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and thanks to the CBA for hosting this series, which I think is so important and critical uh, during this time. Um, and thank you to Jessica and Nick for, for joining us today. This should be a great conversation. Um, you know, just a personal note, I think in our conversations leading up to today and in planning this and in talking about what to, what to cover, I think we all recognize just how important this topic is, connecting with consumers, doing it the right way, uh, and how important it is right now. Um, and so I'm gonna dive in uh, and we'll start some of the questions. I think for all the participants, as you know, you can submit questions. I'll work those in during uh, some of these topics, but also I'll have some time at the end. Uh, so Jessica, I'm gonna start, uh, start with you. I think the industry, which is called the consumer packaged goods industry, the first word is consumer, but so many executives uh, really talk about the fact that they're too far from the consumer, right? That they've become distant over time. They haven't been able to maintain those connections. Love to hear from you about how have you thought about it? How do you stay connected with a consumer? How do you think about the consumer really in everything that you do? Sure, um, thank you for having me here, uh, first of all. Um, you know, I, I certainly, when I was building out this brand, um, I didn't even know about acronyms <laughs> at all. So CPG wasn't even in. <laughs> wasn't a word I've probably ever said in my entire life, um, which is ironic, um, considering I was completely building a brand around um, a gap that I had as a consumer and a real white space that I found um, and, and an opportunity that I found in the marketplace um, and really looking for, from a consumer's lens, me as a new mom, I was a, a young new mom, wanting to surround myself and my new child with the safest and the healthiest um, options available and products available. So what's in, on, and around you really does affect your health. And I was really looking for solutions that I just couldn't find out in the marketplace. There were, there's a lot of greenwashing um, there's a lot of alternative uh, products that were out there and maybe there was one thing they would do right or another thing, but there really wasn't like a holistic um, solution for people who wanted to live a healthy life through the lens of health and wellness, sustainability, 
and also giving back because it's just the right thing to do. And so when I built the business, I really hit on all of those values and those pillars that I have as a person in the world, you know, and certainly thinking of the future uh, that I wanted for my child. And so when I learned about, um, you know, being able to advocate for legislation, I went and did that, right? And I tried to get reform um, around uh, the use of chemicals and just the safety and testing of chemicals, which I was like, this will go through because it'll get more jobs in America. Isn't that what everybody wants? And it's about health and wellness and safety for people. And they just really turned it into like a political issue. Somehow people's health became a political issue. And I was like, you shouldn't politicize health and wellness. So I was like, what's cool about this country is that you can have an idea. And if you work hard enough, um, and if you have enough grit and perseverance, you can really fully realize your dreams. And I was fortunate enough that I have the perseverance to push through three years of rejection. Um, and I finally found, after I pitched this one uh, entrepreneur uh, two or three times, and by the third time, um, it landed with him. And I really knew that I wanted to build a brand that felt human and that wasn't giving me marketing jargon through a legal and regulatory lens, like something I felt like all of the language and the way that other companies were communicating to me just felt so it just felt didn't feel personal and it didn't feel human. It felt so corporate. And so when I built this brand, I initially went on social media. And then I went to all of basically the village that helped me raise my kid, which was online. And I went to all of these events where all of these um, mom bloggers, um, health and wellness bloggers, um, and, and went to these events and I spoke with them and I built community with them authentically. And that took, um, you know, a couple of years. And then our first year and a half after we launched, we didn't spend any money on traditional advertising. We didn't have any money, frankly, to spend on traditional advertising. And so all we could do was be part of a community authentically. And so from then on, when that is the foundation that you're building, um, you are part of the conversation that the consumers are having. And I think that's why we've always actually created the trends that you hear of that uh, McKinsey and all of these other uh, services, they study what we sort of like lay down and, and, and really lay the foundation for what the future company should look like and how you should approach building a business. That's, that's really great. Um, so many important lessons there about being at the center. So it's not two consumers, but it's, you know, you in the middle of that. Um, and we, we often, you know, hear executives talk about, does everybody even use our products? Sometimes, you know, people don't. So that's an incredible lesson. And I think just the stick to of going back and staying in the center. And, and finally, I love the point about sometimes as a small organization, you're forced to make the hard choices about what really matters. Large companies, can, you know, tend to do quite a lot. So there's some great stuff in there. Nick, maybe it'd be great to hear about the last year or so. Um, obviously, we all see the changes in the consumer dynamic, people spending a lot of time at home. What have you seen in terms of those changes? Has that affected how you connect and how the organization connects with consumers? Yeah, first off, again, thanks for, uh, for having us, Paul. It's uh, great to see you. I think we go back now almost 20 years, and uh, it's really an honor to, to, to be here and to be able to share a little bit of our story and as it pertains to the question and, and you think about you know consumers and you know we're just started when she talks about uh the company the business so eloquently it's always driven uh kind of from this idea around purpose and how do we show up and kind of honor kind of that purpose as a purpose-driven business and this mission we have uh as an organization to empower people to live healthy happy lives that is uh, really ringing true today, even more so than it was from a Genesis standpoint eight or nine years ago. 
And what we're seeing now uh, within the marketplace, we see consumers that are more and more focused uh, about their wellness, focused about what they're putting on their skin, uh, what's around them uh, from an environmental perspective, as well as what goes into their bodies. And if you look at how this business has evolved uh, over the last uh, few years, you know, when Jessica had this vision, uh, she also wanted to make sure that there was a convenience element uh, in that relationship with the consumer, uh, this direct to consumer component. What we see now over the last year and even with COVID hitting, we see uh, the relevancy of that relationship from a direct to consumer standpoint become even stronger. If you look at some of the data that's been published over the last uh, year now, or the last few months actually, uh, when you look at personal care, you look at household products, uh, prior to COVID, the actual sales numbers were at about 20 to 25% of consumers would actually buy their personal care, or their household products online. Post COVID, that's ranging at about 30, 35 to in some cases 40%. And we see that stickiness continue. So for us, uh, you go back to how the company was founded, focused on you know, being a purpose-driven business, focused on wellness, and then being able to drive this accessibility. What we see uh, continuing is not just the propensity around the consumer shifting online, but also what we find uh, in the data, and you look at our company and our business, uh, being a digitally native, digitally first business, uh, we see the omni-channel component continue to evolve and people looking at not just online for product, but also what we talk about is content, community, as Jessica highlighted earlier, and that leading into commerce and being able to kind of create kind of that ecosystem to be able to offer products to consumers where they want to access them is what we see continuing to grow uh, over not just today, but the next year and the year after. And that's an area that we believe we can continue to be disruptive to meet the consumer uh, where they want to be met and make our products accessible to them, not just online, but also within brick as well as within the digital shelf. Yeah, and just to build off of what Nick is saying, um, you know, when I first uh, launched the company, I. I knew that the biggest hurdle or challenge would be exactly what Nick is saying around um, just that education and the content, right? Um, because how can anyone know the difference between this or that, or why live an honest life, or how can the products in your home actually affect your health, or how can your buying choices affect, affect your health over time? So that's why I knew um, that, you know, probably the best way to do it was to take all of this science and all of the information that's written in books about chemicals and the link of certain things to your health. And it just felt like so heady and like, who has time for this? So I wrote a book called The Honest Life. And it's just a very simple solution for people. And it's not pushing products as much as a lifestyle. And that really, again, is laying that foundation of now that we've empowered you uh, with the knowledge that you can make better choices that can make you healthier over time and live your best life, now it's up to you what you want to shop. But for us, the most important thing is just giving you access to the information that you actually can take your health into your hands. And so, uh, like Nick said, it's, it's connecting people with the content, the education, and eventually they will want to obviously shop the better option. But we're never trying to just push more things and more products down your throat. For us, our mission is that if we empower you with this education, we know eventually everyone's going to be better off. And that truly is our stance. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, and a contrast, really, you know, Jessica, when you talk about the marketing, right, initially, you don't have a lot of money to do all kinds of things. You got to pick the places to engage people. I, I guess I'd be curious, as you went down that road and you had this mission and purpose, which was pretty unique, I mean, were there a lot of challenges, people saying, oh, that's a small little niche thing, you're not going to really, you know, be successful? Did you have to work through all of that? I mean, I heard the third time of 
trying to get support, but how was that, how was that to go through that process? You know, what's really interesting. Um, when we launched the company, it really was like word of mouth and we were so small that, um, I, I think our biggest challenge was we didn't really, we didn't realize, um, the demand was going to be as high as it was. And so for us, and, and still to this day, it's like keeping items in stock because, you know, there is so much pull. And I remember when Nick came to work uh, with me and joined me and I was like, Nick, it's all about Omnichannel. We have to make these products available everywhere. And there's no better person to be my partner uh, than you to help me really like see this through because people want it wherever they conveniently, they should be able to shop it on their Instagram. They should shop it on their Amazon. They can go direct to us. We should give them the freedom, go to Target, go to Costco, go to Nordstrom. It's up to you. We shouldn't have to put any sort of boundaries around how you choose to shop your products. And it is, you know, obviously very logistically difficult to achieve that. But I think that, you know, being um, pretty like, we're agnostic about where you want to shop. But what's awesome is that because we did have that direct relationship with the consumer and when we first launched, we knew the demand was so high. And then this is back around to my point. I, when Nick came in, it's not like we, I've had so many incoming calls from retailers wanting us to be in their doors. And the way that I've approached even those relationships was, well, do you really believe in this mission? We're not an in and out proposition. We're not a trend. We're here to stay. And if you really believe that you want to give people a solution that's revolving around their health and wellness and making that available and accessible for them, then let's go. Then let's really partner up. And let's not just have one or two things on the shelf. Let's really have a story and a point of view. And, um, and so Nick and I have really stuck to that. And, uh, and there is definitely a lot more pull than push. So it's not like the industry, you know, I don't know what the naysayers ever thought because I never heard them. I just heard from the consumers saying, can I get more? I mean, even to like a $400 eco crib, right? And we did a one for one for every crib that you bought. We donated a crib to a family in need, you know, to be able to sell a baby diaper, a beauty product, and we're getting a lure best of beauty award winning, uh, products that we're creating here and then also being able to sell like a $400 crib and we can't keep these things in stock. Like, no, it's because of the lifestyle and the promise. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the, the piece that, uh, you know, Jessica highlights that I think is super important is when we talk about really the promise, um, you think about, the product and kind of where it starts and and we're fortunate we've invested aggressively over the last few years we have our own internal laboratories uh here in los angeles where we're doing formula develop to formula development to make sure that we have a high bar and high standards around our performance uh, around our products the safety of our products the sustainability uh, of our products as we're always focused on continuous improvement and the key insight that, you know, just talks about on why consumers continue to vote for, for, for honest and, you know, our business, you know, pre COVID was growing at about a 20% clip. Uh, now we're seeing 30% plus we're growing share in each of the categories that we're in. I think the key insight here is it's rooted on the consumer as Jessica was a consumer uh, day one, when she was looking for a solution set of products and a lifestyle for, for herself and her family, that same uh, insight resonates even more so today. And what we're able to do from an honest perspective and as a brand, we're able to deliver against that promise in multiple categories. And we've prioritized really this concept around personal wellness as it pertains to what you put on your skin. Uh, we're now evolving that as we've kind of built out that pillar into what's around you from an environment perspective. So, you know, recently, you know, Jessica highlights solutions when she talks. So we're not just selling items, item and price. We're looking for solution sets for consumers 
you know, when COVID hit, everyone started to become more focused about their wellness, around sanitization, around their hands, around the dryness of their skin, masks, all these spaces that started to evolve. And a lot of folks, you know, everyone rushed to, you know, create hand sanitizers. Um, what we focused on really going back to kind of this insight is adapting our portfolio and creating a solution set for the consumer based on what the consumer is interested in. So how does that show up for us? When you look at Honest right now, during this COVID period, you can send your child off to school if, uh, if their school is open currently. We have you know, a mask that's available for your, the, the mom, the dad, the parent, the child. Uh, we've got a hand sanitizer that's available. We have an alcohol wipe uh, that's available. We have a disinfecting spray uh, that is EPA uh, regulated that we can turn around and deliver to the consumer. So where, where I'm going with that is there's a solution set that now evolves where then we can create the right content and education because when you look at honest.com, it's really a destination. It's our flagship store. It's experiential where you can come spend time uh, as Jessica highlights and create this relationship early on. So there's content available, tutorials, how do you use these products? Then we have offerings that we can turn around and test. That solution set that I just described can actually be offered to the consumer and we see and we measure analytically how that does. And then we can turn around and scale that because just highlighted this accessibility component. Not everybody wants to come and just shop at honest.com. And what we find is within our consumer base, uh, folks that buy at Honest.com, 80% also buy in Brick, and about 45% buy in uh, our retailers.com. So us being able to create kind of that content, create a solution set uh, of products, uh, and create kind of this relationship around accessibility is really a differentiator for us when you talk true omnichannel. And there's no other brand out there that can sell it a Nordstrom that sells at Target, that sells at Amazon, that has honest.com, uh, as well as you know a Wegmans and an HEB. Uh, that is really a differentiator, but it's based on Jess's insight from day one as a consumer. Yeah, and, and I think what's really cool about being able to do that is, you know, how I think as a consumer, as a mom in the middle of COVID, my kids may or may not be going back to school or it may be a flexible schedule. I know their teachers, they're so low funding for um, teachers to even get access to school supplies. And now they have to provide their own disinfecting sprays, their own hand sanitizing wipes, their own masks that they have to buy for themselves uh, in order to even walk into work that day. And we uh, have created these kits, an adult kit, a, chill, a child kit, child-friendly kit, to try and just bring some ease and peace of mind to something that can be quite stressful for people. So it's just a really, and if you are a parent, you can get the kid kit for yourself, for your child, but then you could also get the adult kit and you can donate that to your teacher. And in that same vein, um, or, or it w really with that in mind, when we were talking through this, Nick was like, you know, we absolutely should also have a give back component. So we've identified um, a way to also take some of these solutions and give back to uh, children and families in need and teachers in need uh, of these solutions that may not otherwise be able to afford them. You know, it's, it's really great. I mean, I can, I'm sure we can all hear the energy in both of your voices around the consumer, like whether it's the solutions, Nick, or Jessica, as you talk about sort of people going back to school, it's really central in your thinking. And I think that's pretty differentiated. That may come really naturally to you, but that's a really important component. And I think the, the last question I'm going to ask on this topic is really, you know, the capability that sits at Honest behind this. And Nick, you mentioned, you know, doing testing and Jessica, you talked about you know, people that are talking to consumers. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that is, uh, how you've built it, why it's so differentiated. And I think there's something about trust, right? That consumers have trust in you, therefore they're willing to 
talk to you and share what's going on and share their needs. And it probably gives you, you know, a much better relationship. So anything around the capability and the role that trust plays would be great to hear. And Jessica or Nick, whoever wants to start would be great. Nick, do you want to start and then? Sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I think, you know, where it starts for us, Paul, in this relationship with our consumers, job number one is, you know, when you think of the purpose of this business, holding true to the purpose and it starts with our products. So we like talking about performance. We like talking about safety. Uh, and then we, we make our products interesting. There's a design element. There's something interesting in our products. So us being able to, number one, uphold kind of these high standards uh, with our products is super important to us. Number two, since the company was, you know, started really leveraging kind of social, leveraging kind of PR, being able to be kind of grassroots and being able to understand and actively listen to consumers and start developing that relationship. You know, the trick is how do you do that as you start scaling a business and you make a business bigger? And, 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 and for us, one thing that we've held true to from day one is, uh, an example is we have our customer service organization that's in-house. So we have our own internal customer service team that is connecting with consumers on a day in day out basis with communication and actively listening around you know, issues that exist with products or concerns consumers have around needs that are evolving. Us having that pulse and that one on one relationship is a differentiator for us as we think about products that we're formulating as we're addressing any concerns that exist in a marketplace around needs and where we're gonna turn around and go as we look at our strategic product plans and we look at kind of what's out over the next 12, 24, 36 months and anticipate where that consumer goes. So those areas for us, we believe help in kind of our secret sauce and having kind of this pulse. But then also when we talk about anticipating um, being nimble enough and have invested from an operational perspective to really kind of box above our weight. And, and we think we do a pretty good job of that. You know, when, when COVID hit, uh, we saw quickly on March 13th, as we all left this building uh, to go to our homes and started to, uh, you know, start abiding by the stay at home orders that started to exist across, across the country that there was going to be a need for, you know, better sanitization, better disinfecting, uh, and be able to have products based on the consumers, the, ch the chats that were taking place, uh, where consumers were looking for products uh, based on us studying kind of our social channels. And we were able to quickly uh, be in a position to work internally with our R&D group. We're an essentials business. So we've you know, been able to maintain a staff here in Los Angeles, uh, practicing social distancing, to work in our internal labs, to work on innovation, coupled with our operations team, to be able to quickly within four or five months now, uh, be in a position to offer a disinfecting spray that's peroxide based in the marketplace, based on actively listening, having the capability from an R&D operations perspective, quickly pivoting, securing the right level of triggers uh, in the marketplace, holding true to the formula because it's a peroxide based formula. It's a very clean formula that's in the marketplace and being able to deliver something that now is gonna be in market. It's already in market at places like Amazon at Target uh, would be also in Costco, uh, Kroger, and be able to address really that consumer from day one, actively listening, being engaged, and then having the capability to be able to create a product quickly, be nimble, be agile, and be in market. Um, that's just one example, Jess? Yeah, and I think even a more personal story um, for me when it comes to that is <laughs> I would tell Nick every single day that we came in, you know, we've come into the office, I would say, Nick, every one of the products that, you know, really claim the disinfection, disinfecting a surface, I'm so allergic. I'm sneezing. My kids are sneezing. Like I can't deal with it. We have, if we use these other products, we have to open up all the doors, run out the house 
and leave everything, aerate it for like a solid hour. And I was like, can we please make something that won't make me sneeze and that won't make my kid, you know, run out of the house. And so, um, you know, it's really also that personal story as a consumer wanting to have solutions that are clean and healthy and, and better for you. So, you know, you're not, for us at least, we're not running around sneezing our heads off and having to open up all the doors in the house just because we're trying to disinfect, you know? Again, you, you brought it back kind of to the, the consumer being, you know, you guys. Uh, and that's a that's a huge message. I'm gonna switch gears now a little bit. Um, that was fantastic, and I think it, it gave everyone an understanding of how you think about the consumer relationship. You mentioned before this kind of omni-channel view, but I think your own take of it, right? In terms of Jessica, you mentioned it doesn't matter where people shop, and and Nick, you talked about the fact that frankly, you know, we have to connect this for consumers. And Jessica, maybe I could start with you because the company started with e-commerce. Mm -hmm. um, was that a strategic decision? How did you think through that beginning? A hundred percent, it was strategic. You know, I knew I wanted to launch an honest solution to you living your best life. So that meant I wanted to go into many different categories. I wanted to have bath and body products that are not just going to not irritate a newborn baby's eyes, but it's the soap still needed to lather up and your dirtiest you know, kid running around playing soccer should be able to use it. And then grandma and grandpa should be able to use it. So having just a, a real um, complete set of bath and body products, the detangler should actually detangle your hair. Just because it's made with alternative uh, ingredients doesn't mean it shouldn't work, you know? And I felt like every time I was finding all of these pain points in the marketplace. And so we needed to have a nice full suite of bath and body. We also needed to have those basic detergents. You know, when I'm washing my, my uh, clothes or in my house, a surface, I just want to make sure that those solutions, again, aren't going to make me sneeze, have a rash, my kids sneeze. I don't want to wheeze. No, thank you. You know, and then when I'm looking at uh, what is touching my baby, right? And they have such delicate skin. So having diaper, a diapering solution from the wipe to your diaper cream uh, to a, a balm. I'm allergic to a lot of uh, petroleum and, and uh, petrochemicals and petroleum-based solves. And so I am constantly having all of these reactions. So we created a balm that's this great balm that you can use um, on any kind of s sensitive skin from a baby's bum to a little, you know, any surface of your skin that you may get a little rash. It's just a nice barrier and it's not petro based. So having something like that, that's for everyone and so multi-use to a diaper and a wipe, you know? So launching with 17 products and then being able to bundle it together for peace of mind and ease, when I was a new parent, I 100% ran out of diapers. I 100% would run out of the shampoo and I'd be like, oh, wait, or trying to wash my baby for that night wash. And I was like, wait, what? We have no more shampoo. What am I going to do? Or when you run out of diapers at two o'clock in the morning, hubby, go down to the drugstore and pick up some diapers. Nobody likes that conversation with their partner. So I was like, wouldn't it be great if we could have diapers and wipes delivered to your door? And why can't they be cute? They don't need to have like, you know, they don't need to be brown or whatever, you know, whatever that nature uh, branding is or, or just like leaves. No, thank you. How about it's cute? You know, why can't it be cute? Because diaper changing is not, you know, the most fun experience for some some folks. So I really wanted to bring that design element, that um, delight to something that can kind of be a little bit poopy um, and also create a solution for consumers based off of my own need of never wanting to run out of those diapers at two o'clock in the morning again. So that was one of the big reasons why I wanted to be online, just the convenience of when I do go to the grocery store and I have my baby in the, in a, uh, the bassinet in that front bit of the of the cart I don't have a lot of room either so how can I also 
create a solution so that they're just filling their cart with those fresh uh, products that have an expiration date. And then all the other stuff, get it delivered to your door, man. You know what I mean? And just make it like a really fun and easy and seamless process. Um, it also allows me to listen to the consumer and why we even went into feminine care, why we even moved into um, beauty. I mean, we got so much demand from our customer service, emails from our customers saying, please make beauty products. I have sensitive skin. I have rashes. Da, 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 da. And so that was why we created a clean beauty line is literally from demand from our consumers. So for me, I don't think you can even have a company today if you don't have a presence online. And really you, that flagship experience should always be your online hub because it's also global, right? Anybody can access it. And then from there, I had Costco telling me that, you know, she got some intel from a website and they said the number one um, brand that keeps popping up. And, and she was like, it's like 90% versus the others are like at 10% was honest company for, from this website. And she goes, we need to have you. And so I was like, I don't really know if we know how to do that. And this is like, you know, six months into launching the company. Um, but eventually we opened up Costco Nordstrom was the other, another first, a business that came to us and then target. And so we slowly, you know, rolled out these partners and I was all for it. Again, if you believe in what we're doing and you believe in our mission and if you're aligned with that, then let's go and let's be partners and let's change the world. Yeah. I think just kind of building on what Jess highlighted, you know, when you think of kind of the evolution of the company, uh, you hear a lot of passion, you know, just talking as a consumer from kind of day one around kind of this wellness orientation around, you know, how am I going to take care of this child? Um, one thing we know from an analytics standpoint, about 48% of consumers will shift and change their buying habits and start focusing more on wellness oriented products uh, during a pregnancy. So that's when consumers are doing research, they're, they're doing their homework. So us being able to have that relationship, it's super powerful as we look to connect with a consumer. And then as we start bringing that consumer along a journey around this honest lifestyle, introducing you know, our personal care products, uh, which is you know, a line that goes across uh, the family. Uh, being able to introduce our clean beauty business, which Jessica talks about, all these elements are connected to you know, what you're putting on your skin, how does it impact your overall wellness? And now, as we look at a company that's been around now for, for nine years, uh, to be in a position to play both domestically as well as with our partners now internationally, we have business uh, with Douglas uh, in Europe, uh, Boots, uh, we just uh, launched with Shoppers Drug Mart in Canada. But being able to start to really scale a business and stay very focused around these categories around baby uh, as well as personal care uh, and beauty and kind of drive that kind of relationship with the consumer, that discontinuity and being able to drive it through an omni-channel lens is very unique. And we hold that kind of, you know, true to our hearts in, in, in nurturing that head in the heart with our consumer. But then also, as we think of the future, you know, how we start to build out really these other opportunities uh, as it pertains to not just what you're putting on your skin, but also what impacts you from an environmental perspective. So, you know, what you see from us, Paul, as you look at today and how this brand continues to evolve is really front and center consumer health and wellness and really this emphasis around uh, wellness around your skin as well as around your environment. And uh, that uh, for us is a differentiator. Yeah, you know, the, the discussion about channels, uh, as I listen to you, is a very different discussion of channels. The, the word channels actually came in some ways because of a, a mechanism to sell to different classes of trade and worry about conflict. And that's certainly true for those people trying to get into e-commerce, right? They see that as a challenge. Um, I'd love to hear, Nick, about that sort of the secret sauce behind your omni-channel approach. I think you've talked about a little bit already, 
starting with a consumer, connecting the dots, and then any lessons learned as you have to scale this up, right? Dealing with operational challenges from a you know, much smaller organization to really a significant presence. It'd be great to hear on those topics. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an interesting uh, take uh, and kind of what you've highlighted, we really believe in, which is kind of this whole uh, channel discussion has kind of been built over the years uh, based on your price value equations and how you can differentiate your product based on what you do at club versus what you do in mass versus drug. We've kind of uh, disrupted kind of that, that, that point and that perspective by driving accessibility, but it's rooted in what's the right value proposition? And what should you be able to command in your product on a day in day out basis without playing a high low price promotion game in the marketplace? Because if a consumer, and, and this is where, again, we always root back to the consumer and we're all consumers. If you can find a product you know, in the store at $3, but online it's at $5 because you're managing your channel and it's the same product, uh, that's not a big idea. And that's where, you know, businesses start to suffer and you see it in the data and you see it in how companies are performing. So for us, uh, we really start with job one is, you know, we're a purpose driven business that emphasizes amazing products that are, you know, safe, they perform at a high level. And then we create the right value proposition around that product. And we then create the right level of content the right level of community that then leads to commerce. And when you look at our product offerings, why can we play at Target? Why can we play at Amazon? Why can we play at honest.com and have a hundred plus million dollar businesses in those areas um, is because we get the value proposition right and we stay connected with our consumer with these high standards around performance in our products and the accessibility is just highlighted earlier, if she wants to you know, buy a product directly from you know, us uh, and then be able to send her husband into a store to pick up a product, we wanna be able to be accessible based on where the consumer is. That's great, that's fantastic. I think in the interest of time, I'm getting fantastic questions uh, from all of our participants, which is excellent. I'd like to ask one more question that I'm going to go to some of those participant questions and that's really on the topic of innovation and you know Jessica you talked a lot about bringing products to market solutions to market ideas to market I think the role of your purpose right you've talked about how critical that is how does that infuse the innovation process how does it kind of get right in the middle of the products that are are going out the door well, we have uh, labs that we've built internally and, you know, I guess what I've learned over the years, you know, that 10 million, $12 million business uh, first year is, was very different to the $60 million business year two and so on and so forth. So just, you know, really having to look up, transform and um, adjust the uh, operational excellence that you need in order to execute, you know, the, like I said, the demand of the consumer and the growth of the company. Um, what's amazing and, and literally like when Nick came and joined me here, that's when I started to actually get a, a, like six hours solid sleep at night <laughs> because, you know, I finally had some peace of mind that I had a real partner that understand supply ops and um, also innovation so he, he he and I both really thought through what is the thing that that what is that pain point what is the thing that we should really hone in on that makes us us so that we can innovate and as quickly as we want to and that is around having our own internal labs so we have these standards where we just, we are choosing not to use in personal care alone, 3000 chemicals, right? And that's a higher standard than any uh, standard in Europe or anywhere else, frankly. And so when you're formulating at such high standards of what you're choosing not to put in, but then not just giving someone like different levels of dirt, so to say, we want transformative skincare. We want makeup that actually makes you healthy the longer you wear it. We want our products to 
um, improve the health of your skin when it's on your skin, whether it's a baby product, personal care product, what have you. So in order, we want disinfectant sprays that actually will disinfect, you know? And so in order to have that high standard of efficacy combined with choosing not to use a you know, myriad of, of chemicals that are, that are blanketed in the marketplace, we have to formulate in-house a lot of the time. And so having a regulatory team and a supply chain that can support buying raw materials and all of these things that go into formulating your own products in-house, um, you know, that to me is really what, that is our secret sauce. Along with, um, we don't have to wait for a Bain or McKinsey study to tell us that, you know, great example was parents want a solution so they can send their kids to school with peace of mind. I don't need a Bain or McKinsey study to tell me that there should be a quick and easy kit that you could just buy right away. You know what I mean? And so us just knowing intuitively as consumers what we need and what we want and where are our opportunities. And so that is uh, very much um, part of, our, uh, again, part of our secret sauce and, um, and how we like to go to market and really what makes us different from others. I think also, Paul, kind of in that, in that vein, you know, if I'm in the audience and I, I'm listening to, you know, the conversation, sometimes folks, you know, and I used to sit there and listen to different presentations and talks like this and kind of what the takeaways are. Um, how do you do all of this uh, and do it in a way where you can still accelerate your growth, you know, expand your margin profiles, uh, be profitable, um, to be able to do what's really important for us uh, from a mission perspective, and that's being purpose-driven, uh, being able to connect with our consumers and offer these amazing products and delight them on a consistent basis, but then also be in a position to kind of walk the talk and how do we continue to give back? Um, you know, we're affiliated uh, with baby to baby has been a partner of ours from, from day one when Jess started the business. You know, we've dedicated over the last eight or nine years about 22 million products to baby to baby. Uh, we just donated over 3 million diapers, about 200,000 um, uh, wipes and, and, and 300,000 personal care products uh, over the last year to be able to, you know, provide products to underprivileged uh, parents, families, individuals in need. Um, how we do all of this uh, as a business that at the end of the day, you know, is doing the right thing, is able to create some amazing products, uh, do it in a way where we can continue to support, you know, our consumers and our communities. Uh, for us, as we say, you know, omni-channel, we say secret sauce, we say all this stuff. At the end of the day, that's the legacy that I know Jess had from day one in her vision of what she wanted to create. And that's kind of what we're jointly working with an amazing group of folks here at Honest, because we have an amazing team that box above its weight on a day in, day out basis mm -hmm. to be able to really uphold those values, those principles and that mission. That's a, that's a great segue, by the way, to, to one of the, the questions from the participants, which had to do with your purpose and what role it plays in motivating all of the employees at Honest. Um, coming into work every day, knowing what they're doing, you know, rather than not being sure. So Jessica, maybe you could talk a little bit about that connection between purpose and, and motivation. Sure. Um, you know, when I had this idea of, of this company, I had worked with lots of nonprofits over the years. Um, you know, I, I went to Africa with Bono. I've worked uh, with, you know, global, um, you know, a, a comprehensive um, opportunities for women to, to have education globally, um, Habitat for Humanity, like different mentoring um, programs for women and, and uh, women of color and, and various other types of organizations. And what I found was, you know, when I was looking at how black and brown communities are disproportionately affected by exposures to um, unsafe chemicals, right? And their health and wellness is being compromised on a daily basis. I really saw that 
if I can create a solution that is accessible from a price point, from an ease of shop, um, then hopefully I can not only create that solution for people to live a better, healthier life, but also maybe I can influence the marketplace to change their ways and change their habits. And so uh, really the, the impetus to even create this company really was around this, uh, n this charity kind of idea, right? Most people probably would have built a nonprofit around it, but instead I wanted to build a for-profit business with nonprofit values and a nonprofit ethos. It's a more sustainable way to really make an impact and to scale your impact. I don't need to knock on anybody's door and ask them for money. The consumer's choosing us over them. And by doing that, you are, com you are contributing to a healthier outcome, right? So the one thing that I wanted to address on top of that is there are many people who are born in unfortunate circumstances, right? No one chooses to be born in poverty. It just is what it is, right? So I was also thinking of those folks. How, if I was born in that circumstance, what would I want? And how would I wanna be treated? And so by us partnering with Baby to Baby, we are supporting families in need who have children in delivering those basic essentials for them to thrive. And that is just a basic human value that I have and that I believe everyone should have. Because if you're put in that circumstance, how would you wanna be treated? And so that's why I embedded that into the business model. And, and so when you have the pillar of health and wellness and then helping folks out, no matter their circumstance, that is just, how, that is just what The Honest Company is. So when it comes to bringing talent in and when it comes to retaining talent, I have found that the thing that motivates them the most, 100% has to do with purpose. I mean, we have a culture where people basically work to live instead of live to work, right? Do I have it backwards? Live to work, work to live, yes. So in other words, our whole life revolves around our job. <laughs> so when you bring in that type of, uh, you know, mentality, that um, very American capitalist mentality that you're only as good basically as your career or your job, and that's your entire day, then how are we fulfilling? And, and I think all sort of companies have to look at themselves and look at themselves every day and really reflect on what are you doing every day? Like, what are you really doing every day to make a difference? And here, you could see the impact that you are making on people's lives day in and day out. From, you know, our, cons our customers are like emailing us. They're, they're even all over social media taking pictures um, of their faces with beauty products without a rash, without a reaction, you know? They're taking um, pictures of their adorable kids in bathtubs and saying like clean bubble bath time like we made their days you know more joyful um an experience that could otherwise not be so pleasant and so they want to share and spread the love as well so we see the impact every single day and it does 100 percent help with retention when people feel like they're going into work every single day with purpose that's that's so cool. Um, and by the way, you just did something I'd never heard before. I've always heard the live to eat, eat to live. You seem to have uh, <laughs> taken that to a really cool place. I want to I want to end with uh, with with one last question that that I'm 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 seeing here, which is, uh, and maybe Nick to start, and and Jessica, please add. But where do you see Honest going in the future? What's next? What's on the horizon? It's a great question. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a lot of respect for probably a lot of the participants who've kind of dialed in today that uh, are part of organizations that, you know, have been around for, you know, 100 plus years in, in, in our industry and in CPG. Um, you've got some amazing companies, some amazing brands that have been built to kind of stand the test of time. And, you know, when I first came here and I sat with Jessica and we had countless conversations uh, around this opportunity and what we're going to try to achieve together uh, as an organization, 
this whole component around you know purpose was at the forefront uh, us being able to do less talking and more doing actions along the way and we like to say we walk the talk as it pertains to our products uh, we walk the talk when we say omni channel and value proposition we walk the talk around giving back not just something to do because it's you know the hot thing today uh, and then being in a position to create, you know, a legacy that is a global legacy because we won't be here forever. And I always say, you know, we had a, um, a group uh, in the other day within our organization, which was a management 101 training. And we had some of our top talent that are new managers in the organization. And what I said to them that day is, um, you know, I want to be able to take the keys uh, and be able to hand them over. Uh, to someone in the future uh, to really have a place uh, that gets built that can stand the test of time. And for us at Honest, it's creating this global brand around wellness, anchored in the pillars that we've discussed around kind of what you're putting on your skin, eventually kind of building out this around you component. And there's probably additional opportunities as we look to the future because we want to be always strategy led and do it in a way that upholds really the mission that just started from day one and how do you continue to empower people to live healthy, happy lives uh, everywhere. Jessica, any, any last thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, kind of what's heading next and then I'll, I'll just turn it back over to Jeff to, to wrap us up. Um, I feel like Nick totally <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> That's exactly it. We're very much aligned um, on, on everything. And I think, you know, as, as uh, all of you guys out there um, who might be watching or listening, I have to say that um, one of the biggest lessons as a young, scrappy entrepreneur, I have a lot of grit, man, um, but I never really understood the value of having a partner um, to really see your vision come to life. And I'm so grateful I just um, to, to you, Nick, and I can say it here, I'm just, it's so incredible to have such an awesome thought partner um, and business partner. And, um, and I think as you guys are all thinking of how can you improve, um, pivot your businesses or your companies, just make sure that you surround yourself with people that you really truly respect and value. Thank you. That's great. Jeff? Paul, thank you. And, and Jessica, uh, Nick, thank you so much. Your comments, your passion obviously stand out. Nick, you mentioned that when you participate in these sessions, you're always wondering what are the three takeaways? Three things that stood out to me. One, Everyone's talking about consumer, of course, but you either believe it or you don't, right? You either build your business around it or you don't. And the passion that, that you guys clearly have for the, for the consumer, it is the North Star. You think how you think, right? What are, what's missing in the marketplace? That's what's, what's driving you. And it comes through loud and clear. And I think for, for so many companies, they talk about the consumer, but you're either going to really move that way or you're not. It's just talk. Obviously, with the Honest Company, uh, it's more than that, number one. Number two, uh, from a building business standpoint, I loved when you were talking about the vertical integration, right? When you think of, of COVID, you're not just giving them the mask, you're giving them the disinfectant, you're giving them the hand wipe, you're giving them everything here. And, and you think about the opportunities across the industry to think about how you solve problems, solve situations. I think that's a great opportunity for not just your company, but for others to be thinking about. And then the third takeaway I'd mention is, you know, people often talk about how disrupted other businesses have been, and you almost miss the disruption right in front of you. This industry has been extraordinarily disrupted, and it's been disrupted by startup companies with a new mentality like your own. You know, you think of, and Jessica, you talked a minute ago about a for-profit vision uh, in a non, or a, I'm sorry, a non-profit vision in a for-profit organization. And I think it's that type of mentality that really has disrupted the entire industry. You see major, major uh, multi-billion dollar consumer packaged goods companies trying to think the same way. And that disruption has come from startup companies like yourselves. Uh, and I just can't thank you enough for that and give you enough credit for the, the change you've obviously driven in the industry. So to Paul, to Jessica, to Nick, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and for all you've done for the consumer packaged goods business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us.